Good afternoon, our viewers. My name is Maria Alessi, and welcome to the Women's Show on Civic Space TV. Um, this afternoon, we're going to be discussing the Human Rights Report, the 24th Annual Human Rights Report produced by the Uganda Human Rights Commission. So the report basically gives us an overview of what the human rights status um, of different sectors in Uganda is and provides recommendations on how the state and other actors can do work to ensure a protection and promotion of the rights of different Ugandans across the country. But also sometimes, not sometimes, in this report, they actually do talk about our progress on international mechanisms because we know that human rights practice and thought is governed by international legislation. Of course, I'm not an expert on the topic and to join me in the discussion today is a human rights lawyer, women's rights activist, also my friend, Prima, welcome to the show. Thank you, Maria. Yes, so a few days ago, under its mandate in Article 52 of the Constitution, the Uganda Human Rights Commission um, released the 24th Annual Report. One of the, um, some of the critical issues that the report covers is COVID-19 and the effects of COVID-19. They talked mm -hmm. about externalization of labor, talked about the situation on Buvuma and, and Kalangala Islands because they are considered hard to reach areas and mm -hmm. have had struggles over a couple of years. The extractive industry with focus on Karamoja specifically, enforced disappearance. That was a very big conversation ahead of the 2021 election. Um, refugees, juvenile justice, electricity, international mechanisms. It's a whole collection of things. Mm -hmm. And so let's start from the basics. Um, just so that everybody's on the same page, what is the mandate of the Uganda Human Rights Commission, and how do you how if I wanted to reach out to them in case of a violation, how would I do that as a regular Ugandan? Um, the mandate of the Human Rights Commission, as you have mentioned already, is provided for by the Constitution under Article Fifty Two, mm. um, but also. The Human Rights Commission, the Parliament has put in place a specific law governing its operations and what they can do. The Human Rights Commission is in charge of um, handling complaints by individuals. If you want to complain, unlike uh, regular ways of reporting a crime or a violation of human rights, you could just walk in at any office of the mm. Human Rights Commission. I know they have regional offices across mm -hmm. the country. I have seen a branch in Jinja. I have seen one in Kapchora. I have seen, I think, in Bali, in Bara. And Kampala, of course. There's mm -hmm. always a complaint desk and a complaints officer. Any regular Ugandan, you can walk in and in any language, present a complaint against another Ugandan or, or even non-citizens mm -hmm. commit abuses of human rights institutions so the human rights commission can address complaints from individuals mm. both natural and artificial persons companies can make complaints and persons can walk in and you can and the good thing about the commission is you can complain in any language you don't have to know how to write or yeah. anything I, i'm also sure they have toll free lines Mm. I don't have their toll free lines of head, but I know they should be available on their websites mm. or signposts where their offices mm. are. Uh, the Human Rights Commission also makes recommendations to parliaments on uh, enforcement of human rights and gives them advice on what instruments as a country that we should be assenting to. Mm -hmm. or accepting as a country mm. to bind our people, but also to make laws in line with that. Mm. The Human Rights Commission also makes reports, regular reports. I think they're supposed to make annual reports, but mm. there are years that go without <laughs> these reports <laughs> report. coming out on the status of human rights mm. in, in the country as a whole, and, and still make recommendations to Parliament on how to redress some of those issues that are not going as, you know, in line with human rights or promoting people's liberties. Mm. Yeah. Yes, so you've talked about um, their mandate and mm. how they exist to make sure human rights issues are highlighted. Mm. One of the interesting things about the report this year is that it is silent on issues of human rights that 
fall within the spectrum of people who have been criminalized. Mm -hmm. So, for example, we know that during the pandemic, sex workers were one of the, um, the, the, the groups of pe community, the people who are marginalized the most in that process. Yeah. We also know that members of um, sexual and gender minority communities in Uganda, because of their criminalization, um, were also were also suffered a lot during the pandemic, but also continue to be excluded. Mm -hmm. Would you, and just in your opinion, do you think that the Human Rights Commission should be able to highlight these violations even while there's a criminalization? Because um, I think that they should be able to have a foresight in relation to human rights as uh, beyond just what the law provides for in the country. Yeah, I, I would say so, but I don't speak for the Human Rights Commission because mm. I don't work for them. Mm. But as an institution that is body corporate, what that means is they are independent mm -hmm. of government. I know they receive their pay from government, but they are supposed to have independent opinions and mm. make advisory opinions to the mm. government, but also the country as a whole, because they are the experts mm. in this thing called human rights. Mm. You know how everyone likes to say, oh, human rights is a, a foreign thing. Concept. <laughs> but we have Ubuntu in our languages. Mm. Human rights is about the dignity of people and humans. So sex work is as old as humanity mm. themselves. Sex workers had so much to suffer. People suffered during COVID like no other time. The other day I was listening to some colleagues who were sharing stories of sex workers during the, the pandemic because our office was open and our toll free mm. lines open and we were receiving complaints among people that were being arrested for just being out breaking the curfew were sex workers. Mm. And, and, and to imagine that most of these sex workers that were being arrested, some were not being detained per se. But a friend was sharing that the sex workers told them that they would arrest them at a particular police station. Mm. There was this policeman who had a glove Mm. She would demand for money from the sex workers. Mm. And when they would say, no, we do not have the money, she would say, I know where the money is. You remove your panty, oh, she dear. puts her glove in there. Mm. Apparently, that's where they keep the money because before, the mm. policemen knew that the money was in, in the, the bra. bra. Yeah. So then they molested them to oh. grab the money. But now they changed where mm. they put the money. Mm. Now there was this specific female policeman who would say, I know where the money mm. is, and was using one glove on a line oh dear. of several women. And I was thinking the indignity mm -hmm. of having to go through that. These are mothers. They are your, our sisters. Mm. They are our caretakers. They are people we work with during the day. Well, so many people were found on sex work, but... Mm. So many people work and use these sex workers. So acknowledging that there's human beings in our community that have no choice but to resort to this kind of work mm. is important. And the Human Rights Commission is in a good place to let the public and, you know, public institutions know mm. that maybe someone is a sex worker or a sexual minority or a queer person. Mm. These people exist in our community. I know the president has written a paper in the past mm. acknowledging that we then have terminologies. Yes. We have words <laughs> defining these, these people, people yes. in our traditional languages. Mm. You can't say they're learning these things from out. No. Yes. We've had them since time immemorial. Mm. And respecting them, handling them with dignity is important. Yes, you raised something very critical in there, and I'm going to take us back to that discussion on COVID because the report also talks about it. Yeah. Um, violence against women and girls because that was a very critical part of um, one of the biggest ramifications of our lockdown mm -hmm. and all our SOPs, right, for during the pandemic. When they said stop movement, it was not until women were dying on mm -hmm. their way to give birth that they said, okay, now you can, you can, border borders can move pregnant women. And you see that also depends on at what stage of pregnancy am I? Yeah. Because some people, their bellies don't come out until maybe they are seven months, right? Mm -hmm. So how then do I show someone that I was pregnant at that point? We also had cases of rape of children 
because to this day, defilement still stays one of the highest cases um, of crimes against children in this country. We also mm -hmm. had a surge in in just dom in domestic violence, like intimate partner violence at home, because many people had never, I guess, stayed in the same space with their spouses yeah. for that amount of time. But also just the frustration from the economic um, hardships that we were going through at that point. Mm -hmm. So. Teenage pregnancy was, I think, like the of all the highly reported, it was the most reported. And what it did was at the beginning of the school going term, there was a bit of contention between who is allowing who to go to school. The ministry mm. said that the girls could go, but I think there was a bishop in Mukono who said, no, 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 it's against our moral stand as the church to allow pregnant girls into school. Do you think any progress has been made in response to to how young, to, in, in response to how girls who have been raped and uh, and got pregnant have been able to access education uh, between that time and today. Progress. I, I think there was a bit of progress as we were opening up in January mm. this year. You know, the ministry came out very strongly to say all pregnant girls should be allowed in school to come and sit their mm. final exams. And those that have been, or those that have given birth, they too, breastfeeding mothers, should mm. be allowed in schools. Then you had the uproar from religious sections of the society. I, I, and I call this hypocrisy because mm. religious leaders were closed. Mm. They had facilities. Their home, their churches, for a long time we kept arguing, but churches can be shelters. They should be the place where women run to when they are suffering violence. Yes. But instead, when you're hurting, when you're in pain, and you're in pain for something that is, you know, fornication, mm. then the church shuns you. They don't want to know. Even when it's not fornication, interestingly, because churches <laughs> don't have shelters mm. for women in proper marriages to mm -hmm. go when they are experiencing violence, pain right? Violence, yeah. yes. Instead, they were being told to be tolerant. You know, and preaching the sermons of tolerance as mm. opposed to condemning the violence. Mm. That is not right. As a church, Churches are progressive places to be. Mm. Religious institutions should be alive to what is happening and quickly respond because they have the institutions mm. in place and mechanisms to support society even more than the government, I would mm -hmm. say. Because I know almost 70% of schools in Uganda mm -hmm. are religious, yes. are put up by religious institutions. 60% of the health workforce in Uganda is supported by religious institutions. So they have a big role to play in re-entry and retention of girls pregnant, breastfeeding, lactating. Mm. If the girl wants to go to school, every day I tell my team, the girl should be the determinant of whether or not she can sit in the class. Because yes. I have seen girls who have got pregnant when given a chance and supported through school, they actually sit through and excel. Yes. Unfortunately, those that are not supported, that is the systemic injustice, the systemic violence. Mm. When you put in place a sweeping law, say, oh, you should not come to school when you get pregnant, only mm. report two years later. Mm. In those two years, what have I been doing yes. to cope? To be able to come back, you mm. have grown, your mind is thinking differently. Maybe you started making money or you're working, your child... I mean, now you need to, you have a little one to support. Mm. There's no opportunity yes. at rolling back. And yet if they let you go through school, you get out, give birth, come back immediately, you don't lose as much time. Mm. If you were in S2, by the time your child is two years, you're in S4, you, you have something, you can get a certificate and give a living to your child. Mm. As a country, I strongly believe that we have to be very radical and deliberate about the policies and... Um, laws we are putting in place for you to just sit out there and, and it's it's very sad that the people that make these laws are people that are not giving birth today they're people that are done with school yes. privileged people mm -hmm. our policy institutions are not representative of the people we have in the community and, mm. and that's a big problem again i think mm. the human rights commission is in a very good, good place, place to bring to light you know, like comparable situations elsewhere. Because some of these measures 
are being taken radically by countries that want to see progress across the African nation. So aside from saying we recommend that a policy, we recommend that, a, mm. you know, I think what they say in their report is that they recommend that um, legislators, yes. local leaders are appraised on the policy on retention. Mm. But what is that policy? What does it say? Is it compliant with human mm. rights standards? There's basically no analysis of what the recommendations in Thailand, how practically they, they can, can be put yes. in place. Yeah. Yes, aside even just from the recommendations, like when I think about it, like policy is one one like one like part of the solution, right? Mm -hmm. The other is what accountability mechanisms are we putting in place for stigmatization within the schooling environment? Because mm -hmm. even if a girl wants to go back to school and her family is really supportive and she comes to school, um, and she comes to school and the teachers are the ones saying the small things that um, dehumanize her yeah. or her classmates are the ones saying this like even how do we talk about a teenage pregnancy in 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 within church spaces because if you if you're preaching at someone or if, if someone is teaching in Sunday school and they are talking about teenage pregnancy in a way that dehumanizes these girls who are always victims because at mm -hmm. that age they are not capable of, of consenting right um and then we, we talk about them in a way that they will not even be willing to go back to school because they know that the mental responsibility of being in a space where you're continuously dehumanized mm -hmm. is um is 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 makes it really difficult for you to study. And for me, the other thing that I'm thinking about is also like how the Human Rights Commission barely like talks about the like beyond the laws how do we talk about the social fabric how do we talk about the context in relation to the way people are thinking about a thing perceiving a thing mm. because if we think that sex workers are the worst human beings under the face of the of the sun of course even if government passed a policy the interhuman relation in the community is going to be really really difficult yeah Yes, yeah, so the other thing about um, the COVID-19, and also it's, it's mentioned a little bit in the report, is access to healthcare. Uh, during the pandemic, we saw that uh, this country, like we're really on our own, eh? like <laughs> it got to a point where, <laughs> yeah. where having money didn't even save you anymore, yeah, no. that if the hospitals were no. full, they were actually full. Mm. And in relation to that, at the, I, I think like two, three months ago, the Ministry of Health, uh, dismissed all the workers who worked during the pandemic who did the response and then mm -hmm. a few days a few months later they came and told us all oh, that the numbers are going up so you need to you um do your sops and there was um there was a doctor who said so who's going to treat these people the same ones that you fired and you did not want to pay <laughs> Yes. Oh and God. so what do you think in terms of um, access to healthcare right now are going to be the struggles, aside from even the fact that COVID is still here, mm -hmm. many, very often we forget, right? And also the fact mm -hmm. that now we're seeing an eco like the economic tide is changing and mm -hmm. our government is not budgeting or thinking about us like we are actually, like the state is not being frugal. It's just continuing business as usual and expecting the rest of the citizens to be frugal. So as from a human rights perspective, how do we address this and how do we ensure that moving forward, the basics like healthcare are still available and we can maybe hopefully have different reports in the next year? Um, healthcare in this, in this country, and I think COVID was such a wake up call. You would assume that our budget, maybe we would say now the healthcare budget should be maybe 20% of the national budget. Mm. But no, alas, no, in 2022, we are still saying, when are we going to realize Abuja 15%? Yes. Travesty. But um, I know lately the president is also emphasizing local solutions, local vaccine, local initiatives, but you can't start after that is here. We must learn to plan ahead, yes. we learn to, to, to invest in our systems. During COVID, the, the, the policies, again, I keep saying systemic violence was so averse, even within the healthcare system, even mm. though we know that most of the care supportive roles in health facilities are done by women, mm -hmm. women were least protected by yes. those policies in that time. You were talking about access for pregnant women, pregnant girls, girls that have suffered violence, but there are those who had pre-existing conditions already. Mm. You know, simple things like ulcers. How do you prove an ulcer to the LC? 
I know. And why do you have to even prove it? Exactly. Why do you have to be taken through the indignity of that? And people would say, oh, it was an emergency. It was a pandemic. But even then, there mm. needed to be exceptions. Yes. And that insensitivity to passing, sweeping declarations is how you found so many women in jail. Mm. And you're thinking, I was raped. I needed yes. emergency health care. Yes. But how do I prove my rape to the LC? Let alone the LC could have been the one who raped me. But let's or continue. the LDUs. Yes. <laughs> yes. The LDUs might even be the one who, who, who raped you or mm. whatever. It, it was difficult. So we need to invest more. We have to be very intentional. Uh, I, and I would expect the Human Rights Commission to do that suggest the investment and it's not just the suggestion i don't know we keep saying aside from just saying we are monitoring implementation mm -hmm. by visiting jails prisons health facilities no there should be some level or measure of accountability mm. we know public accounts committee following up land questions those are great but when it comes to necessities even people who had billions were not allowed mm. in other countries because everyone's health yes. system was was overworked. You know, was overworked, was overwhelmed, protective gear for those that were even willing to support mm. locally were not there. I think we can also invest in local solutions. You know, sometimes when you're talking human rights, people are then thinking, no, mm. healthcare is everything that comes from out. We have VHTs. Yes. It was a good time to actually equip VHTs mm -hmm. with information, education material, to co educate communities, mm. support communities with basics. But that, you know, like barely, very inactive, traditional birth attendants, there's too many ways. You know, we've had this discussion of incorporating traditional birth attendants in, within the yes. health system. Yes. And there are too many women up to 60%, that means there's a 40% of women that still prefer going to the traditional birth attendants. So if mm. the traditional birth attendants do not have the skill yes. to support these women, we continue having maternal deaths, preventable mm. ones, yes. for things that someone who is skilled with their local knowledge, you just add a few things, or maybe mm. equip them with those scissors and you yeah. know sterilize and do it locally and support the woman within the community but she has to walk 10 kilometers before she can access someone who can give her mm. the care that she needs to be able to give birth mm. you know i strongly believe in local solutions answering no, I, our, yeah. our questions as well and mm. i think again because they have a mandate to do the research yes. and advise the government, again, I go back to the Human Rights Commission, they need to start investing in this as well. Yes, I completely agree with you in terms of local solutions because um, I guess it's also the idea that we don't see a lot of things as like human rights discourse, right? Mm -hmm. Like the way you're talking, for example, about um, being able to equip um, village health teams or... or um, the, the birth attendants, the traditional birth attendants with the necessary skills. And, and we don't look, like when we look at healthcare, we don't look at the sociological aspect of our society. Where are people located? What do they do? What are their preferences? Yeah. One of the most interesting statistics, um, uh, sorry, piece of information I came across when it came to how people use alternative medicine, what we call traditional medicine, right? Mm. Is that even when I go to a hospital and get uh, medicine for flu, I'm still going to resort to uh, like an alternative. So mm. it's, it's, it's been very rampant amongst people who suffer from malaria, people who suffer from um, long-term diseases like cancer, right? So yeah. they, they, they go through chemo, but also resort to, to herbs and other forms of treatment. And so we've not done enough of this work. I think when we go to a point in the in the pandemic and things weren't moving and then we had covid decks come up now people were the the national drug authority was <laughs> yeah. very interested yeah. in this but previously if it wasn't like the whole idea of modern medicine quote mm -hmm. unquote modern then we did not want to participate yeah, or subscribe to it, it yeah. yes you've also talked about local initiatives i know that a couple of months ago government um launched the um, vaccination initiative something so it's it's somewhere in tinder there and one of the interesting things about it is that so this is like it's 
I guess it's partly state funded. I can't confirm that, but it provides uh, like vaccination for people. Um, at I think they, they charge a small fee for like facilitation purposes, and I can be corrected if I'm wrong. So what? fascinated me about this right is that we are doing we are creating all these initiatives which are really great but we're not doing the work of how do we get the communities to be vaccinated more what's that what what in light of especially access to all sorts of information because mm -hmm. this information is a real thing in the yeah. vaccine thing there was a it time is. when people were putting coins and saying it makes you magnetic <laughs> <laughs> We've really been through that ghetto. Uh, yes, like uh, it, it makes you, um, it, it, it gives you, like it makes you magnetic. So there's a lot of all this disinformation. Yeah. And, and I don't think government is doing enough, especially to let people know like, so this is what they are saying and this is the actual response to it. Of course, there's, I guess I can sympathize with them because bad news travels faster, way faster than yeah. like good yeah. news, right? Mm -hmm. So the other critical thing that the, the, the report talks about is access to economic and cultural rights. And so I'm going to lump them up together because in there there's um, the right to work, there's externalization of labor, they talk about extractives in Karamoja. Um, and so I'll start with the discussion on externalization of labor. This mm -hmm. has been one of the most contentious things in Uganda over the years. So statistically, between in the last about five years to six years, between 2017 and 2021, the number of labor exporting companies has grown from 66 to 216. And then the, the total number of Ugandans in the Middle East out there working is 145,997. Those and are that's the all. documented ones. Those are the documented <laughs> ones, yes, because they can only count them, so I'm going yeah, through the, the, company. the companies. And 78% of these people are actually women who are working yeah. as domestic workers. And in that in that trade, there's been issues of human trafficking as one of the key violations. There's been um, violence in the workplace. Like these women go and Uganda's laws don't extend to Saudi Arabia, for example, no. because that's the biggest a recipient of, of this kind of labor. And so we've seen, and, and of these people, interestingly, that the, mm. okay, not even surprisingly, the biggest number of people trafficked under these processes are young women. And these are women under 18 because they call them female juveniles. So how over the years do you think, aside from just like reporting the statistics, and I know that you've handled a couple of cases yeah. on this, what, what are the experiences of these women and what are the things you think that the Human Rights Commission is not talking about or responding to enough mm. in relation to this violation? Um, women have suffered, even as we speak, I'm sure there's hundreds and droves that yes, are leaving the yes. country. And now, these loopholes that have happened, I know they recommend that the Ministry of, Ch of Gender recruits more labor officers. Mm. That, you know, these labor officers may be like a focal point at mm. every, every district. Mm. They, I think they're asking that more be recruited, more be sensitized, more. And aside from bringing on board more labor officers, because I've noticed that this externalization of labor is a source of income for the government. And as you had mm. the president very recently, if something is bringing in money, mm. we should pay attention to it. He could not consider reducing prices of certain products because yes. when they gave him the numbers for how much money those taxes contribute to the income streams for the consolidated fund, he said, no, what that means is we, everyone else should have their game make more money, find a way to survive. Mm. And that's heartbreaking, putting money ahead of people's lives. The reason why women are running out of this country is because of the high unemployment rates. Mm. And if the government assumes that the only answer to this problem is to send in domestic workers to the Middle East, then it has always been my argument the government must invest in protecting these girls mm. without that extra protection for the labor force of the country mm. it amounts to slave trade yes because these these they are more fast agreements that they have signed with saudi arabia 
with some few states in the Middle East. But the aspect of investing in the, how can I say, the offices and embassies, mm. equipping them with staff to receive these girls when they have complaints, because if Saudi Arabia is not responsible for these people, it's their citizens taking these people. Mm. There's an agreement allowing you to bring in these kids. But how are you protecting these people? If these people are bringing in back money, what are you giving back as a country? Unfortunately, we don't even have an express law. Mm. There's just ministerial Statement, guidelines. Guidelines. Just yes. guidelines. Mm. And, and I have read those guidelines severally. The government more like defers its roles and obligations to the labor companies. Mm. And I know that Ministry of Gender has put in place complaint desks. But in my opinion, for the cases we have filed there, mm. we barely get a response. Mm. Usually you will file a complaint. I think there's a threat to withdraw a license. And if the company has money, they will swing into action. Yeah. If they don't, problems. But for those girls that are just moving, my friend is in Dubai and they hooked me up with a friend. And then you get there and the only mm. place you can be is a brothel. But you have to pay for daily. Yeah. Those girls cannot even declare their presence to the mm -hmm. embassy of Uganda. Yeah. Because then when they go to the embassy, the embassy will blame them. Why didn't yeah. you come through? Again, company? yes, they keep blaming like <laughs> the person. But the mm. country needs to be to show more responsiveness. Mm. We need a dedicated budget. If these girls are sending back money, that is going yeah. back into the government coffers. Yeah. The government owes them a duty of care. Yes. So the Human Rights Commission, once again, has an obligation to do research. See, when the COVID pandemic hit, mm. the embassies in country here, the U.S. embassy sent messages to all U.S. nationals. They didn't have to have come through USID mm. or support of the U.S. Mm. So long as you had an American yeah, pass, visa, yeah. a passport, passport. Mm. you received a message. If you want to leave, there's a flight tomorrow. Yes. For us who are locking our <laughs> citizens out. Yeah, don't come back. <laughs> Stay there. We actually yeah. watch them The out. Swedish embassy was doing the same. They mm. got flights for their citizens yes, who needed to leave, to leave urgently. Yes. There were flights taking those people out. Mm. It was too bad for Ugandans, mm, everyone like for themselves. Out. And you know, the minister and the president were all there saying, okay, you went out of your will. Stay there, yes. take care of yourself. If you come back again, you can't even access your people. You come back mm. and still pay for yourself. Yes. It is sad yes. that when it comes to drawing money out of these people, the government is very active. When mm. it comes to supporting and protecting them, it it's none tricky. of their concern. Yes. We need to do better. So we're going to take a short break. And when we return from the break, we will be talking about then what are the trends we need to look out for in the future and what are the things that as citizens, as a few of us who in places where we can provide recommendations, what are the things that we can actually, what are the kind of conversations we need to be having and mm -hmm. looking forward to. Okay. We'll return after the break. Digital rights are those human rights and legal rights that allow individuals to access, use, create and publish digital media or to access and use computers, other electronic devices and telecommunication networks. Digital rights include a right to freedom of expression, information and communication through technology, a right to privacy and data protection, a right to credit for personal works, a right to universal and equal digital access, a right to identity, a right to anonymity, a right to be forgotten and a right for protection of minors among others. The state's digital rights are frequently violated through various unfair actions, for example, blockage of websites and social networks, theft of credentials, unauthorized use of people's data for personal gain, privacy intrusion, online censorship, arrests and intimidation of online users, internet blockages, and a proliferation of laws and regulations that undermine the potential of technology to drive social, economic, and political development worldwide. It is hence every citizen's responsibility to respect rights of other digital users and to speak out or report to the responsible parties when one's rights are violated. Welcome back to the Women's Show. We have been discussing the Uganda Human Rights um, 24th Annual Report. Uh, and I'm here with Prima Kwagala. So Prima, 
We've talked about a lot of things in the first segment, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about um, the human rights trends. We've talked about COVID. We've talked about uh, externalization of labor. Uh, we've talked about violence against women and girls. We've talked about access to education. Really, we can't finish everything because mm -hmm. at every turn of, of, um, of our lives, there's a human rights violation. Sometimes we don't even know that our rights are being violated, especially like in areas when it comes to like <clears throat> labor laws, when it comes to issues of access to information. Very mm -hmm. often we don't even know that our rights are being violated or even data protection. That is like one of the most interesting aspects of um, violation of rights. And it's interesting that actually the report does not talk about issues around um, like cyber rights. I know they only talk about social media because of the shutdown that happened in 2021. Mm -hmm. But issues of data collection, there was a report against um, Safe Border as a company. I think it was written by Bowman's. I was talking about how um, it was a NITA study that showed that a safe border can access almost all the data on your phone because of the way their their system is structured and they don't even let people know and so like and those are violations that we like exist with mm. on a daily. But moving us forward, um, so what are the trends we need to look out for? Because this report is a report that covers mostly 2021. We are in the second half of 2022. What are the things that have happened in 2022 that you think? think the Human Rights Commission should look out for, but also the things that we as citizens should be able to look out for. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned the Data Protection and Privacy Act. That I came into force, I think, about two years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, regulations to operationalize or put in place the, the law have been passed. I think since last year they've been information going around. I know within lawyers' circles, people have been discussing registrations. Mm. If you're collecting personal information, you should be registered. Yes. So that if I have a complaint, I can go to the Data Protection Office at NITA, the National Information and Technology Authority, mm. for redress. Mm. I don't think many people know that. Mm -mm. You know, Human Rights Commission has a mandate to educate communities mm. on their rights, responsibilities yes. so that they can conform so mm. i think a new area or an area that the human rights commission also needs to lay emphasis on is educating people on some of the new laws that have come in place mm. what are their rights that ensure from these issues but how can they enforce them where can they go do we always have to go to the human rights commission or there are some other places mm. that are quite specific that we can access mm. Questions of data privacy. You just mentioned the issue of safe border. Mm. I'm sure Uber yes. is the same thing. Mm. Uh, Facebook. Remember the social mm. media sh shutdown. Yes. WhatsApp was off for a very long time, but people were using VPN, VPN. and we saw government and media continuously mm. communicating via social media, which was apparently which shut down. Yes. So how is that happening? Mm. How does equity happen yeah but we could also see violence being meted out to so many people via social mm. media or even just the monitoring that led us to violence because you tweet and they pick you up right mm -hmm. you tweet and someone slides in your dm and says you these things that you're tweeting <laughs> like <laughs> like using right. it as a yeah. platform mm -hmm. to threaten us um and and, and and to curtail the way like people's freedom of expression yes yes and, mm -hmm. and we saw that with the famous Kakwenza case. Yes. The man has fled and his family is unable to exercise mm. most of those freedoms. Right? Again, from social media. Um, violence against women also. We saw it manifesting mm. online. Yes. I don't see a discussion of that. You know, many MPs could not campaign during, especially female MPs. Yes. If you have noticed the trend in parliament, there was a drop in representations of women. Mm. Many women could not campaign because it was not allowed to move from one place to another. Yes. Almost, like less than 5 million Ugandans mm. are on social media. So how do you get your votes as an MP who is unable to move or cannot afford radio space yes. to, to be able to express? Because and for women, that is mm. a, a big disadvantage because many of them don't have the resources. Mm. The resources are in the hands of our brothers and, mm. and, and fathers. So that is an issue. Violence that is coming through social media, you know, nudities, insults, 
bowling online. Oh. Who gets to curtail these people? Uganda Communications Commission. Who knows where they are and who mm. can be called? I understand mm. there is a complaint desk there as well, mm. but how fast they act. But we've also still seen that. Too many. Yes, we've also seen the Uganda Communications Commission not doing their response um, in a fair manner because you see a lot of their saying so and so can't be on TV or so and so can't be on radio, specifically targeting people who will be saying or doing things that they consider against the state as mm. opposed to people who are actually violating actual human rights because some people can come on tv and make threats mm. at citizens and um and nobody's going to hold them accountable but for you you just come onto the tv and say listen we deserve access to better health care and they'll be like prima you can't come because or, or even whether it's formally or informally, because mm -hmm. media houses have reported that they have been situations where a story runs and they, 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 someone picks up a phone and calls you and says, why is that story running on your TV station? Mm. So there's that, but you also mentioned the question of uh, externalization of labor and some of the emerging trends. Mm. Trafficking. You know, when we talk about trafficking, people are always talking about these girls that are leaving the country, mm. but internal trafficking. Yes. These people that draw these young children from Karamoja. Did you know apparently there's a, someone with a home, mm. they bring these kids from maybe Karamoja or very remote parts of Uganda, promise them employment in Kampala, mm -hmm. puts them at home and then places them on streets every other morning. Yes. Who is monitoring that internal trafficking? The Human Rights Commission needs to start educating people. Mm -hmm. Yes. But you're sending your child to Kampala to work, but their job is to beg. Yes. Even we're the picking. fact that we, we and pick begging. them up <laughs> yeah. from their homes in the village and we say, oh, no, no, we're going to support her to go to school. Mm. And we bring her here. And one year later, she's still a domestic worker in your home because that's actually part of the trafficking discussion. Yeah. There was yes. the time I confronted a radio presenter who was talking about a girl he mm. drew from, from Kavali to come and apparently work for him. Mm. And then I think he narrated on his show that um, this a neighbor saw this girl fighting, I think mm. fighting or beating his daughter. Mm. So he drove from work, went, and he said in his own words, mm. I beat that girl so hard that I'm sure. And aside from beating her, he mm. sent her back home oh dear. without pay. And I, I sent that man a message and told him, you committed a crime. Yes. You're not supposed to employ anyone under the age of 16. Yes. And not that you've not even paid them, <laughs> you've right? You've not paid them. And then you've beaten you've tortured them. tortured them. Yes. You know, the law is that if you must employ a 14-year-old, mm. they must be under the supervision of an adult. Yes. This is a child fighting with a child. I it's, understand. It's a thing that, that is happened. a thing. She is not being supervised. Yes. She, she, okay, she's fine. She's fourteen. Yes. Maybe the other one is five or six. Mm. But both are children. children. Yes. The same value you are attaching to this one, yeah, mm. is the same value you should attach to to the fourteen. So if someone old, gave yes. you their daughter to expose them to Kampala, it's not so that you can treat them as less than. Mm. You know, and then this man was like, "Hey, I grew up in Kabale. This is how everyone treats uh, maids. And I was like, no, you have a platform and responsibility to yes. educate masses. You yes. used your platform to abuse and yes. insult women yes. this morning. Yes. Also the fact that you should I, go to jail. You're lucky I'm confronting you in box, but yes, you I could expose you yes. publicly. Yes. And I don't know. I think that guy blocked me, but I was like, I don't care. At I've least told you. <laughs> I've yes. told you. If yes. you ever do this and you get in trouble, mm. this is wrong. And this could be the trend or the norm that is happening everywhere, but mm. it must end. Yes. There must be a generation at which we say no. You know, Human Rights Commission, so talking about trafficking internally, what that guy was doing on yes. radio is... It's More just like perpetuating yes. trafficking. What he did is trafficking. Mm, it actually is trafficking. It is trafficking. trafficking. Yes. It is torture. And he was saying it with so much glee and, you know, vilifying people doing care work and how we should have cameras in our homes <laughs> to monitor these people. I hear you. I hear yeah, you. That is not what life should be. Mm. Maids and the people we 
choose to do domestic work in our homes are human beings. Mm. If they are children, they must be supervised. Yes. It is your job as an adult to teach mm. them what to do. But they must also have the right to education, right? Mm -hmm. Because even within that space, if you're going to employ them, it must not affect their access to school that's yeah. the other part people forget because if you're going to employ a child i don't know how it would work like yeah. because ultimately if children are in school from eight to five by the time a child is coming home they are tired you're also removing from them the dignity and um, the opportunity to just be a child because if i'm going to come back from school and then start to do the care work because i'm the one who has been hired to work at home yeah. that means i'm going to sleep at 10 p.m what does that mean for my access to school so not mm -hmm. being able to look at rights in the um, in the full circle of saying that it's not just one thing that's violated at a time. It's like when one right is violated, there's a series, a series of, other, of other, rights other rights that, that are actually violated. violated. And for me, I guess that's like a gap I also see in the report. Like the report doesn't create the space to link all these discussions together. Like we talk about the right to healthcare here. We talk about the right to education here, but without mm -hmm. realizing that when people are not well informed, their ability to take advantage of healthcare services is also reduced. Mm -hmm. Because if I think that me having a boil is equal to witchcraft, then I'm not going to go to the hospital. When you, you mentioned um, emerging trends, mm -hmm. I wanted to mention the issue of surrogate mothers Yes. organ trafficking, mm. kidneys, hearts, bone marrow, nowadays even sperm and ovary. Mm. I know when the, the new organ and transplant of tissues bill was mm. read to parliament, I think three days ago, mm -hmm. this week on Monday or Tuesday, a friend of mine told me, called me and asked, does that include ovaries? I have been working for such a long time, I am I have not been paying attention to family, but I realize that I have amassed a bit of property. I must have a child, but I don't mm. feel like this for next year. I would like to store my ovary. Do you think that bill yes. <laughs> covers my ovary? Mm. I, and then I, I, it took me back in time. I have received cases of people that store their sperm and ovary in certain banks in this town. Mm. Those banks are not licensed. Wow. Those banks are not, mm. I don't know, it's not clear if the people yes. that work in there are professionals mm. or they know what they are doing. Mm. I know a guy who came to my office one day and his wife was distressed. She practically got a mental health problem because they had been paying for years this facility to keep their sperm and over until mm. you know they were they working ready, out of yes. town so that when we come back to Uganda with mm. our money, we can have a child. Mm. They've been storing their things. And then these guys were like, yeah, but you know, Kampala, there's no electricity sometimes. So that thing got spoiled and we poured them away. And guys like, but I've been paying nice. a fee on a monthly basis. Oh there's no law. Yes. You know, and violations of human rights also occur in when where there's an omission on the part of government. Mm -hmm. They have omitted to put in place a law. They have omitted to regulate the health sector, mm -hmm. you know, expressly. There is no specific law that regulates health workers, except for the medical and dental practitioners council yes. that is more like in charge of their ethics. Mm. But when it comes to this crockery, yes. this, you know, stealing from people, we have a large percentage of Ugandans that are suffering from sickle cells. Many of them need bone marrow transplants. Do you know there are Ugandans who donate their bone marrow for other people? But usually they will get a vulnerable person. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, but you have too much. We just take out a little and yes. give to this other person. But yes. they'll promise you a life. Mm. They'll promise you an education, maybe a job. But after they've taken your bone marrow, they disappear. And you have nothing to say. There's no yes. drone contract. I gave you my bone marrow. Mm. The same goes for people who donate blood. <laughs> like, oh, who, yes. who can yes. draw blood? Who can do mm. this? You know, issues of human rights violations and intrusions on people's dignity have evolved. Yes. And the laws, the Human Rights Commission, again, in their reports, they should be highlighting these things. Because I know we have reported that case mm. to the Human Rights Commission. And to this date, it might be eight years later. Mm. We've never got a hearing, a scheduling, or, and yet they're saying our mandate is to address complaints. 
A guy came to my office. Mm. He had donated his kidney again. A Ugandan. People mm. keep thinking of going to the Middle East and then yes. they draw out your kidney. Yes. It happened here mm. in Kampala. And this guy was, I think, he promised 10 million shillings. For his kidney. For his kidney. And he gave this wealthy, fancy person in Colorado his kidney. And then later his money was not paid. And he didn't have an actual contract. No contract. Yes. It was just a verbal thing. You mm. have two kidneys. You only need one. Give us one. Was you are far far? Mm. We will give you ten million. He's given a few millions, and of course, it is his first time to make mm -hmm. such big money. Just a kidney. Yes. The man now starts suffering with wounds, mm. and the people that took the kidney yes. don't want to know. He's mm. cut off. There's mm. big dogs outside the fence. He can't access. Person is a big person. Mm. So they ran out of money, but the mm. Human Rights Commission did not address our complaint again. Mm. So it is important the emerging trends of mm. how human rights are being violated mm. lately also should be highlighted and again advise government on what they need to do. Yes, you've talked about emerging trends, and I'm thinking about. Um, when it comes to like economic practices, so there's a there's been a surge in growth of um, cryptocurrencies, online trading, mm -hmm. and things yeah. like that. And we don't have like a proper regulatory system or practice in Uganda, mostly because many of these things don't originate here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So people lose money in those processes, and there is nowhere they can actually go and report because who is even if the state was to hold someone accountable who who are they going to hold accountable and i guess mm -hmm. those are like and it's it's also like a thing you can't talk about because losing money is also a shameful thing within our society that prima you invested in a coin somewhere in the sky <laughs> and you lost <laughs> your cash yes, and you're going to now. laugh right mm -hmm. because yes and those are important things to talk about like for example cheaper cash is on the is on the um, is on the radar now. Everybody is trying to invest in it. Do people actually know the way these companies are registered? Do we have a database that mm. cho shows us that this company, a public database? Because why should I have to go to Uganda Registration Services Bureau to find out which companies does Prima own? I should be able to just go onto a portal somewhere and yeah. find out who owns this, how is it registered, are they filing their returns and things like that, right? Mm. So companies that are setting up, that are doing business here without necessarily physically setting up here, mm. how do we hold them accountable? Uh, because when you lose money, is that money protected anywhere? Is it insured anywhere in the system? And the answer is usually no, because mm. when these people lose money, people just get heart pain and then they continue. But there's no one to really <laughs> prosecute <laughs> In the That's process, true. yes, yeah. and those are like, and those are critical emerging trends. I think that the Human Rights Commission should actually cover, yes, yeah. and respond to until until the state that we're missing laws um, in this area, in this area, in this area. Yeah. Um, and so, for me, in terms of moving forward, right, as Ugandans, apart from the state, because um, again, I have my personal bias that mm. I feel like we, it's it's completely like at this point, I feel like us talking to government is sometimes really just such a burden because <laughs> we're going to keep talking, right? Mm. Uh, but also feeding into the, I guess, the one gap we haven't talked about in the report is the sense of continuity, that something was reported in the twenty third report, sorry, mm. the twenty first report, how is it covered in the 22nd how do we even know that we're making progress because yeah. again the mandate of the commission is to monitor so they should be able to tell us we've made this amount of progress uh aside from just laws also in practice for example what would a progress in enforced disappearance ending enforced disappearance look like and that trend cannot be looked out outside elections because we know that that happens during mm. elections so in terms of moving forward, in terms of how do we make the most of this report, but how then do we produce reports that can be consumed, uh, <clears throat> but also applied in a practical way mm. to the lives of Ugandans? What would your recommendations be around that? Um, I, I think, like you rightly put it, the Human Rights Commission needs to very, very deliberately maybe have a section within their report say in the 23rd report mm. these are the recommendations we made to government these are the actions that government has taken mm. this is still pending then maybe go to the yes. new issues or new places they have visited and what is emerging there from there should be some sort of 
not necessarily accountability because mm. I know that every time I confront them about accountability, they say that's not our role. Mm. There is a public accounts committee in parliament. There is a human rights committee. You can go and ask them. This report can be used for advocacy because mm. I know even as non-state actors, we have a role as active citizens to, to ensure that some of these things are in place. Mm. Aside from just giving us the information, the commission also has an, an obligation and a duty to be held to account for some of these things. It's not enough that you went and established that indeed safe houses exist, mm. that this number of people has disappeared. Because mm. I think parliament has also established. We have seen families going to testify in yes. committees in parliament to say, my sister disappeared, my mother mm. disappeared, my child disappeared, my brother or my husband. Women calling out these people in the media, establishing that indeed those people disappeared mm. is one thing. But monitoring is also, did those, were those people found? If they were found, then, then what? Yeah, so I, I think they need to go Yes. Further and beyond just mentioning issues mm. to actually following up to find out if those issues were addressed or not. Yeah. Yes. And, and for me, I think on a personal level, like a recommendation is how do we bring back to life discussions on civic education? Because a problem like I'm doing a transaction on a body part and I don't have a contract is a discussion of civic education. Mm -hmm. What are we teaching children in school? This morning I was listening to um, a podcast on YouTube and this lady was talking about how education should above all else, like it's important for us to know that mm -hmm. the, the, the smallest unit of a human body is a cell, right? And this is the most active part of the cell. Like that's very important information, but there is information for day-to-day -day existence of people. Like how do we do transactions? What does a contract look like? This should be information that should be available in school. Yeah. Um, because there's a way you can teach a child who is seven years old that this is a transaction. We have an agreement. If we have an agreement, mm. we write it down and we sign and we get someone to be a witness. So that people, this can also be part of like, let me say, uh, community because we do community policing sessions for crime prevention but that is also part of crime prevention because yeah. if i don't have a crime if i don't have a contract and something happens to me not having a con having a contract is helping to pro um to prevent a certain crime from happening that even mm. if in the in the event that it it happens we're also <laughs> enabling the state to be able to investigate because then there are processes they can make reference to right yeah. so for me it's um the human rights commission taking into um, like serious consideration, the fact that their role to do civic education does not only happen at the point at which, you know, usually they come up election time and people always think civic education is me learning how to vote and being able to vote. But it's a lot of other things that engage me as a citizen with yeah. the law and my civic duty mm -hmm. beyond just voting. So Prima, thank you so much for joining us in this conversation. And to our viewers, I would like to say, take time off to look for the 24th Human Rights um, report from the Uganda Human Rights Commission. You can read it in segments. The good thing about these reports is that you don't have to read the whole thing at once, right? <laughs> you can pull out the section you're interested it's not in. An exam. <laughs> yes, it's not an exam. <laughs> okay, some people might be doing a bachelor's in human rights and oh, that's yeah. part of it, right? Mm. But it's it's important for us to know what's happening in our country. It's important for us to be able to engage from a point of information. But thank you for joining us this afternoon and we wish you a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.